In preparation for today, I've consulted with about three dozen former and current Wall Street leaders, former and current corporate CEOs, and well-known academics. I've asked them all to challenge me. And I must confess surprise at the uniformity of their opinions. In my opinion, Congress, as our ultimate check on Wall Street behavior, deserves its fair share of the blame for our recent financial crisis. In trying to understand how we got here, many point to a deterioration in the character of our Wall Street leaders. No doubt phrases such as, your word is your bond, good ethics is good business, the client's interests come first, have been replaced by, we can hide debt, limit disclosure, hopefully I'll be retired by the time this blows up because it will blow up, liar's loans, and we can help you make earnings. However, my former professional colleague, Professor Ken French at Dartmouth's Tuck School, did challenge this assertion that our current generation of Wall Street leaders is really different. And the more I think about it, he's right. Our history shows that human behavior has not changed. One example that comes to mind is in the late 1980s, I'm sure we all remember being told that insider trading was over. However, in fact, we know that today, insider trading is alive and well. So in terms of understanding Wall Street, I want to start here. In my opinion, while Wall Street certainly doesn't own Congress, it operates in an environment where it thinks it does. As a former managing director at two major Wall Street firms, I remember the pressure from both to contribute to our political action committees. While writing that check was not mandatory, we all knew that our senior leadership was aware of who contributed. And of course, that as much as 90% of our total compensation was in the form of subjective discretionary bonuses. One year after reviewing a list of the senators and congressmen who were recipients of our largesse, I asked two management committee members at my firm, do we really have to do this? And for all, forever I will remember their verbatim replies. Because we owe them. And because those idiots in Washington will continue to do whatever we want them to do. Now, actually, it wasn't a verbatim reply because idiots was preceded by a modifier, which I can't <laughs> say in this form. But clearly, in this regard, Congress has yet to demonstrate an understanding of how MBAs think. For a relatively small direct investment in Finance Committee senators and congressmen and their Wall Street lobbyists, these firms have been unleashed to earn tens of billions of dollars, a return on investment that only Warren Buffett can dream about. Yet while I know you here in this room today are, are here to help Main Street, I would nonetheless maintain that the financial services industry has proven to be very adept at taking Congress down its own path. How else could you explain to your constituents that in 2004, by unanimous vote, the SEC changed the so-called net capital rule. And I want to read this. According to the New York Times, Wall Street wanted an exemption for their brokerage units from an old regulation that limited the amount of debt they could take on. The exemption would unshackle billions of dollars held in reserve as a cushion against losses on their investments. Those funds could then flow up to the parent company, enabling it to invest in the fast-growing but opaque world of mortgage-backed securities, credit derivatives, a form of insurance for bondholders, as you all know, and other exotic investments. The five investment banks led the charge, including Goldman Sachs, which was headed by Henry Paulson. Two years later, as we all know, he left to become Treasury Secretary. In loosening the capital rules, which are supposed to provide a buffer in turbulent times, the agency also decided on the, to rely on the firm's own computer models for determining the riskiness of investments, essentially outsourcing the job of monitoring risks to the banks themselves. <coughs> How could you explain to your constituents that Congress failed to act when predatory lending practices came to its attention years before the mortgage bubble burst. Congress repealed the Glass-Steagall Act. 
Congress resisted reform efforts as Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac expanded their portfolios into subprime securities and loans. Congress passed the Commodities Futures Modernization Act, which exempted credit default swaps and other derivatives from regulation. Congress watched our once trusted rating agencies clearly place their own interests before investors' interests. And this is a big one. The investing public remains confused as to whether a financial advisor is a fiduciary and thus held to the standards of the 40 Act, requiring them to put their clients' interests first, or whether their first duty is to their firms, not their customers. During one set of hearings last year, the exchange that ended up on the evening news concerned whether Wall Street firms still owned or leased private planes. Of course, the Wall Street CEOs appeared uh, contrite and humble. And certainly this played well on Main Street. But the important issues of conflicts, oversight, and, right, and fiduciary responsibility were once again obfuscated. I want to talk for a moment about illegal versus unethical. Recently, Goldman Sachs has been demonized as the poster child for just about everything that went wrong with Wall Street. Certainly, Goldman and every other Wall Street bank can be accused of putting their own interests ahead of their clients. And by their own admittance, these banks, quote, ate their own cooking and choked on it. However, given all the fallout from the recent financial crisis, one has to wonder why not a single leader of a public Wall Street firm has yet to be criminally convicted. Wall Street's new generation of leaders has proven to be extremely adept at practicing unethical behavior without crossing the illegal line. One of the more recent examples is the accusation that Goldman Sachs bet against its customers in the CDO market. Success in institutional sales on Wall Street is, return, is determined by relationships, which are built upon mutual trust. It should work so that an effective Wall Street institutional salesperson becomes an extension of the client portfolio manager's decision-making process. The salesman comes to the portfolio manager with ideas and research. The portfolio manager then responds with feedback, which helps the broker-dealer's trading desk buy and sell securities, thereby creating liquidity for our capital markets, and determine the right price for new issue securities to clear the market. When transactions occur between these sophisticated counterparties, sparring is part of the process. But it's respectful sparring, and it's based upon trust. Your word is your bond. If, in fact, Goldman Sachs marketed securities as underwriter and simultaneously bet against those same securities, thereby driving their prices down, then a trust was broken. What rational investor would buy securities from you knowing that you were betting against them at the same time? While that behavior may not have been illegal, most certainly it was unethical. Decades ago, when a Wall Street firm was off sides with an institutional investor, that investor would pull the wire, put the account in the penalty box, or terminate the relationship. In recent years, as we know, there's been a consolidation of Wall Street firms. The big have gotten bigger. Today, many institutional investors tolerate this unethical behavior because a firm like Goldman Sachs is too big to put in the penalty box. That institutional investor doesn't have any, as many alternatives today and can't risk not having access to the broad menu of products that a firm like Goldman Sachs could offer them. Anyone who understands the Wall Street institutional sales process knows that to market securities to any class of investor and simultaneously bet against them is not doing God's work.